Hello. I am Yonel Bolyanats Mandresh, and I'm here to do another video. I've um, decided to do it in the dark and uh, let the light of my laptop and the light of what's on the screen illuminate the room <laughs> with uh, what I'm saying and what we're going to go over here today. We are going to deal with the occurrences of something very interesting. The word asher, asherah, ashereh, that occurs in the Bible. What most people don't realize is that there are over 5,000, 5, hold on, 5,502 um, occurrences with Strong's Hebrew. Um, concordance entries over 800 about 834 um, in a variety of ways that's it's just actually this word is all over the Bible and what is interesting is I'm going to that I'm going to show you is that there have been those that interpret it differently and associate it with Asherah what happens with this word in the Bible is they translate it to the English with, with which everything, everything that. So they're taking this word Ashera and they're and they're interpreting it a variety of different ways. Whom they're 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 interpreting it as whom, where, after. Of which, about which, they, all matter they chose. Uh, I mean, just is how. So this word asher, ashera, ashere, and various ways that it's used. Um. After look at this, you can see clearly that as now. If you just interpret, let's just say you just throw in Ashera as the God name there. It can actually make some interesting translations. Even here, wives all manner, they chose or Ashera God chose. Or even uh, from the ground, Ashera has opened, or from the ground, Ashera has opened mouth. I mean, you could you can just uh, from the tree Ashera I commanded. I mean, this can this can go into you. There's you could just pick whatever. There's there's so many his work Ashera God, all his work Ashera had created God. I mean, these are you could you could obviously you'd have to retranslate and reposition some of these words and the grammar and the whatnot to make. Um, some other interesting associations and, and translations of it, which it can be done. Um, you, it's all over the Bible. It's all over the, the, the uh, book of Genesis, which is very, very interesting um, because not only, not only is a share in the Exodus story with Moses, when God says, Ehie, Ashere, Ehie, I am that I am. I am Ashera, I am. And that's what it says. Not that, I don't think it means that, or which, or all these other variations that you have. You have you have all these varieties, and in some cases, it may be applicable. But I think that, like, and it's and, and, and in some places, it's very close to the word to other words relating to God, and they can be translated in different ways. Now, I'd like to show you. Um, 
something right here. This verse, this this comes from um, this comes from this book by William uh, LaForest Reed. It's a dissertation presented to the faculty of the Graduate School of Yale U, uh, University in Candidacy for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. So this is the nature and function of the Ashera in Israelite religion according to uh, literally and archaeological evidence. So back to here. He took this line, Deuteronomy. Yahweh would parallel Asher. Yahweh is the shield of thine help and Asher the sword of thine excellency. He, did, he directly interpreted the name Asher as a name. If you see it, it's with a capital A. Right there for that. Now, if you go into a variety of Bibles, I have quite a few different translations of the Bible in uh, my home. Every single one of them does not translate that like that. Every single one of them says, and he is the sword of thine excellency or something like that. All these modern translations do not show this like this. And he is actually showing it the way I'm looking at it. So where this word is. He's looking at it as a name for Ashera, exactly as I am doing. Now, there's some other stuff going on here, but I just want to show another thing since we're on this. Um, the, the, the two figures I'm going to show here are these, and it's by Z. Mayani in whatever this book is. It's obviously in French, page 34, figures three. He takes the double figure of that, of Ishtar, and the double cross in the face as the Asherah. The fourth uh, figurine uh, says the crosses are said to be Asherah's symbols of Ishtar. Okay, so look, look, here's the figures. Look at this. What does that look like? It's a three-bar cross. There's a two-bar cross, three-bar cross there. It looks like a Orthodox cross or a papal um, cross. Now, if you look here on the face of this image, it looks it's either two or three bar. I can see another slight, I don't know, indentation. There might be three. It, the, at minimum, it's two. Let's just say it's like that one. Let's just say it's like this one here. Either one. These are figure. These are figures directly associated. Like I said, that the Ashera and Ashera is related to the cross. The cross is obviously a symbol of Jesus. Um, Ishtar, Ishtar, Ishtar means star. Staros, the word stauros in Greek is the cross of crucifixion. If you look at the word uh, stauros, here, take any one of them. It just doesn't matter. Look, let's let's look. Look here. It's just an S T A U. Tau. There's Tau right there, and there's Ros. Ros. Now that can just be an inflection. The Ros is also means red. Red star. Red cross. Did you ever notice that red crosses are associated with? various chivalric orders, whether it's the Knights Templars, the Knights of Malta, and various other other uh, relig religious groups and orders. Red Star. So that could be, that can directly be interpreted as Red Star or Star Red, Stauros. And if you just, um, if you just remove the S, you could see T-A-U. So that's Tau to Tau Cross. Doesn't matter if it's a lowercase type T or an uppercase type T, it's irrelevant. Um, you have the Stauros is the Red Cross. It doesn't even have to be red. You can just look at Stauros as with as a form of Greek, uh, a Greek word with inflection. With you know, Stauros just means star. So the word Ishtar. Stau. It's not necessarily a deity per se. Um, the way the way 
you have a lot of modern interpretations. You could go online and you could find figures of Ishtar as a goddess. And I'm not saying that there's not a feminine element involved with these religions, because obviously they are. But Ishtar, the word itself, is means star. Even in Egypt, Ast, A-S-T, or Aset, or which is incorrectly translated as Isis, a Greek variation. I don't even know why they do it. The word is directly Aset or Ast or Asht, Ashtar. That's where Ashtar, Ishtar, all they, these are all connected. They're all one and the same thing. And um, what it, even the symbol for Isis, one of them is a star. If you look at a cross, a cross, if it's a cross, it's a star. It looks like a star. Okay. So what the Asherah, which Asher in, in Egypt is Osiris. So what it's talking about, what these things are talking about, is you got some figures, some, the, the, the Asherah and Asherah are the, I would just say male type figure deity, like Jesus. And the cross itself is like, character the cross itself is a symbol and is is a part of life and a part of the resurrection it's a it's it's, it's one of the the things of it now these images you have of ishtar online they're all just no different than like jesus or other historical religious figures or other mythology uh, figures and characters they're they're just made up people can draw whatever and say it symbolizes this or that like you know how many pictures of Jesus are there? Is that really him? Probably not. No. Did he look anything? Probably not. We don't know. <laughs> At least maybe some of the older ones might be a little bit closer to what he actually looked like. But let's just say all the newer versions of it, that's not what he looked like. So they're, they're modern renditions of these things. Now, um, back to this. This is from that, from that book, okay, from that dissertation. And in, in, that, in that dissertation as well, and others, I've read other books, there, not everybody agrees. This modern thing that just Ishtar or, or the Asherah is the goddess. No, that's a modern invention. I'm not saying that there's not feminine elements to whether it's Hebraic religion, Judaic religion, um, and the regions where Asherah and Ashtar and Ashtarot and all this Ishtar stuff isn't that it may or may not have been represented as that but i'm just saying right here usually and if you look at christianity itself which is the modern version relic of these things look this is a three bar cross that is a three bar cross right there okay that is a, obviously a symbol of christianity I don't care how you, you, that is no denying. Now, people aren't, a lot of people aren't shown this in modern times, whether it's the double or the three bar or whatever. These are the Asherah poles. These are the Asherah, th th this is what it is. What is this? You're still looking at a cross, man. I mean, even on here, whether this is a, let's just say it's a female figure or not. Does it, I don't know what that is. I, don't, I can't make out what that is. Maybe it is a few, but I can't tell what that kind of figure. Look, even this looks cross-like right here. This is a sh associated with a Shera or a Shera. God, this is not about this is not about goddess worship at all. This is showing that part of this religion, the the symbol of a cross of some form, whether it's three bar, two bar, one bar, whatever, is part of it. So what makes most sense? This is this is basically part of the religion. Of the of the of the dying and resurrecting deities that go into the underworld, no different than Inanna in in uh, Babylonian uh, Sumerian myths, goes into the underworld and is resurrected by her father Yah, E A E A Yah. Okay. Now that can mean that the cross itself, that that could be. There's a wide variety of interpretations with this, but the, but the cross itself is a symbol of the process of resurrecting or rising up. When I see, this is one thing I, I, um, I've said this to others before. When I see a cross, a crucifix of Jesus, 
you can look at this as a man put on a cross being literally crucified in the sense of, you know, punishment, torture, whatever you want to call it. Or you can look at it as a symbol of being put on a cross, being put on a star, rising up. When you're put on a star, made a star, you're raised to a higher level. So sometimes these are figures of speech, or they can be, okay? They don't necessarily always just have to be literally interpreted. And even let's say something really did happen like that that whole process can be reinterpreted. In other words, we regularly use things as metaphors, even if they're based on something real, or we can have a story that has an example or a, or a teaching or a truth or, a, or something. So this and resurrection, to resurrect means to, to to die, to be buried, and to be resurrected is like going through a change, okay? Whether it's real or whether it's figuratively. And symbolically, you have in, the, in, in a lot of uh, mystical groups, initiations, or even in Christianity with baptism, that's technically your death and rebirth. So death and rebirth rituals and myths are nothing new. They've been around for a long time, and they serve a purpose. You have a three-bar cross here that's part of Orthodox Christianity, and also the papal symbol is three-bar. Now, there are other symbols for Asherah, or the, they constantly refer to, the, this is the thing, you have areas where the Asherah poles were supposedly were, or different uh, artifacts are found archaeologically. Just because you find a figurine of a woman or a man or whatever at a location does not immediately mean this is the god that they represented. That doesn't mean that. Just because you see, like if you go to a person's house and they have a bunch of ducks, or you know you see all kinds of knickknacks and figurines in pe people's homes. Some people have like dogs or horses or whatever, little figurines. Does that mean they worship horses? Does that mean that represents the horse god? No. That's exactly what's going on here. Every time they find something, it means the god. That doesn't mean that at all. In fact, I personally think that a lot of these figurines can represent the priest. It doesn't necessarily have to represent a, a, a deity. Because don't forget the priest or a person or the initiate embodies that concept, that religious deity concept. So these things don't necessarily have to be just that. Here's, here's one figure of Ishtar that, um, that is straight from Amman, Jordan. Amon, Amman. Isn't that a coincidence? <laughs> Jordan, Amman, Jordan. But let's say, okay, let's say, here's, here's a face. They immediately say this is Ishtar. Okay? How do you know that? How do you know that this isn't just a person or this isn't a, a temple something or other, a priest or, or, a, or a, even a leader or a, or a whatever, a queen, a guy, something like that? Because that, queens and kings and things, they represent the deity of whatever their religious systems are. That's, that's quite well understood. Kings, queens always represent divine forces, sometimes solar-based, depends on you know, the area, the, 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 the country or the group. Now, let's this face, is this a supernatural goddess? This looks like a human being to me, okay? Looks like a human being. And it probably is. It's probably. Now, I'm not saying it's not, say, Ishtar, some supernatural. Maybe she, you know, space alien. I have no idea. Okay. This looks like a person. Now, the face of that can change because why? Because if you look up Ishtar online, Google it, images, you'll see a bunch of different images, modern, old, this, that. You'll see different figurine type things from archaeological places that might represent Ishtar, the word star. 
Or I said, does this look like Isis from Egypt? It's the same deity. It's the same concept. Each one is different, represented different, differently. Because that's how it's done. So this concept of the, the priest or the initiate or the, 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 the follower, the believer, takes on as a form of theosis, apotheosis, the deity, you take that on. Whatever gods you worship, or God, you become that, you represent that in one way or another. So that's what's going on there. Let's look at here. The symbol of the Tau. This is, if you can see this, these are alphabets from a variety of regions and nations. Okay? Let's look at the Tau. Stau, Stau, Tau. Every single one of them, except what, modern Arabic, I guess, but even that is, if you look at here, every single one of them represents it as a cross or an X or a T. Every, practically every single one of them. This one looks right here, a Milos. And that's supposedly 900 BC. The one looks slightly like a Y but it's still obviously just a variation of a T with the bar across. So this is uh, the word Tau, Tau, and Stau, and Stauros, totally means that, a cross, totally. So even like things like with the Jehovah's Witnesses where they say Stauros is a stake or it's just a pole. Yeah, it's a pole with a bar across it. Man. I mean, it's been... That idea that, that it's not because they try to be so different and they want to look, they don't like the problem with Jehovah's Witnesses. Is they don't like, they don't like these other nation symbols being involved with Hebraic Judaic concepts. They want to view it as separate because it's pagan. They're, no, yeah. Judaism, the Israelite religion is pagan. It came, in fact, it's pagan in the sense of, let me re-explain pagan. Pagan just means like peasant or rustic or somebody from the boonies, basically. Okay, more or less like a bumpkin. Okay, what you have in any center, you have, say, the official beliefs, religion and whatnot. And um, that is the official thing. But whatever the non-initiates or the people, the peasantry in the boonies or whatever they start to make up and associate, they'll take concepts and then they'll elaborate on it and make their own thing. That's technically what pagan means. You could have two different centers that have completely different belief systems and it has nothing to do with Christianity or non-Christianity or Judaism or non-Judaism. Non it's purely what the official centers, what they believe and what they officially have versus what the less knowledgeable people interpret or what they elaborate upon. That's what pagan is. It does not imply, it doesn't imply a particular religion. So in other words, you could be a complete devout fundamentalist Christian, but if you are basically don't understand and you're just first tier initiation, in other words, you just believe in the literal stories, you, you, you take it all, whatever, you're technically pagan. It's not about celebrating nature spirits and, and things no it's about it's the people that are non-initiates and the, the peasantry or the people that don't understand the official religion so basically in one way or another everybody's technically pagan whether they're regard whether they're they're celebrating old folkloric things or not so those those that terminology is misused because where now you have basically judeo-christianity and then you have paganism and then this things no there's paganism within the Israel. Anybody that's a literal follower of Judaism and, and Christianity is technically pagan because they don't understand the deeper mysteries and elements of it all. I, I, I hope that makes sense because that's really what it means. We have a lot of artificiality in terminology and jargon in modern times. But anyways, the Jehovah's Witnesses basically have to face this fact that all nations, when it comes to the word Tau, where the word Stau, Stauros, Red Star, Red Cross, 
comes from? Why do you think that, like, even in masonry, um, or uh, let's look, Red Star, Red Cross symbology, and I don't mean the organization, the blood organization, isn't it kind of ironic? You have the Red Star, you got these things with blood, and then you got these organizations based around blood. So, but that's what it is. This is an ultra reality. Okay. So I hope people get something out of this and even Jehovah's Witnesses. Even Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> um, the three bar cross. I like personally, the way I look at the three bar cross is um, it can also be used and it's not official, but from my point of view, it's the Kabbalistic Sephiroths as well, or emanation symbolism. You know, with Kether, Bina, Okma. You got to. You can view them here like this. And then, in my, and in my uh, Kabbalistic um, diagram, I use a three-bar cross. So that's and the the three-bar cross is a very important uh, symbol. And as far as I'm concerned, it uh, it's a part of it, as well as a part of the crucifixion. And the symbology of the crucifixion. So, I hope people got something out of that. Going back to this, you have Asher, Asherah, all over. Every level, every living thing, Asherah have done or has done. That could be an interpretation. I mean, these these interpretations would have to be kind of moved around of the covenant Asherah I am making. I mean, <laughs> I mean, some of these you could just you can just throw it in there and make some sense out of it if you move some words around or reinterpret the line, transliterate it. It doesn't have to be like these are not fixed in stone. I mean, there's I've said before there's a lot of Biblical interpretations that are inaccurate, very inaccurate. I just gave an example where um, in that dissertation, he was looking at it exactly like I did. And I have been doing my thing before I ever read that book or his dissertation. So this is all over the Bible. So when you retranslate this, Ashera, Asher, is one of the dominant gods as Jesus of the Bible. That's the only interpretation that I think makes the most sense because, look, there's biblical passages that talks about a shira as part of temple worship. In other words, it says the Asherah poles, these things, these things you're seeing, these three-bar, two-bar crosses and whatnot, were in the temples at the altar of God, of Yahweh. And I said before, Yahweh isn't just a name. Now it's more like just a name, a generic name or general name. It's the ancient vowel chant that was done. It was done in conjunction with the deity of Asherah as Jesus, as Jesus, Yeshua. You have Yeshua, you have Asherah. These are just variations of each other. They're regional variations. The older variation is from Sumeria, Babylonia, Kad, Ashur, Assyria, coming down. And then it's all over. Look, the, 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 at the main, most bottom line point is that a version of this word, Asher, Ashur, Asar, is worshipped as a god all over the Middle East. Okay? That's a fact. The word ast, istar, astar, stauros, tau, 
whatever is a is a is a cross for the and, and a symbol for star is all over regardless whether you feminize or or masculinize these words they're all over there is no way judaism the israelite hebraic religion is immune from that and separate from that in fact it's all over the place in the bible what i just showed i shared the word is all over the place now it might in some cases be used the way they're trying to use it or it could it could be reinterpreted completely different and it's all over the the book of genesis that cannot be denied so when you have these passages in the bible where it talks about that that the israelites worship Asherah or Asherah was at the thing at the, at the altar and there the Asherah pole is by the altar what does that mean that means it's a cross either on the altar or by the altar no different than you have in a church today it's all it's practically identical I mean and I know that a lot of people are going to have a problem with it because they like you got this modern thing of God adding goddess elements to whatever to he especially to the hebrew religion it's like their way of screwing with it which is fine i'm not even against that the point is that it, that's not what, really what it means it's not that there isn't a feminine aspect the shekinah feminine aspect or the holy spirit aspect of being a feminine thing is nothing new the feminine aspect of god is sophia and all that's nothing new so they, 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 they none of these things nor i deny the feminine feminine components but when it comes to this and the way things are being translated is asherah because it's ashere, it's not feminized uh, a s h e r a h. It's a he at the end, which the he is the letter e. And and another another myth is that um, there's no vowels in Hebrew or in Egyptian. Yet yeah, no, they did the the their consonants certain were like let's say the tetragrammaton Yahweh, Yahweh, whatever Yehovah, whatever you want to call it. The i, the h. The U, the, the Vav, va, work like vowels. Now, as, as you, when you contrast it with other languages, it alters that. But that's what how it was originally used. And so you're creating words that are that are actually, when, when you, in modern languages, we're creating words that are not really correct from Hebrew or even Egyptian or whatnot. We're, we're modernizing. We're making them no different than, say, the, one of the gods of Egypt is Osiris and, and Isis, but that's not the name. Those are Greek variations of it. What are their actual names in hieroglyphs and how would you pronounce it? Asar or Aser, Usar or Ast or Aset for Isis. And, but, and just having that incorrect translation that we're so used to in books, they never, I hardly ever see it correctly translated in any liter in any like serious books. They always use like what these scholars or whoever established a long time, they just use that format over and over and over again. And that creates a form of separatism. But that's not how it that's not how it really is. When you go back to original sources and actually look at things, how they really are said and what they are, you can make a lot of connections. Now, of course, there's gonna be a zillion things where in one region a word etymologically evolved into some other way and means something else. And of course, that happens in all languages. But the point is, is that when you're dealing with with historical and antiquity things, and especially when it comes to these religious matters, I mean, look, let's just say this right here. If you didn't know what this symbol with this three bar cross is, if you show this to just a simple, let's just say a simple person from a village in Eastern Europe, they're going to look at that and say that's a three bar cross, an Orthodox type of cross, or if you're you know, into Roman Catholicism, you could say that's the Pope's cross. And that's what it looks like. Because you know what? That is what it is. It's the cross. It's a three-bar cross. Here you have a two-bar cross. Crosses have been used forever. And here you have it right on the face of the figure here, whether that's male or female. And what it appears, if you look here, this looks like a cross as well. So how... Now, the, whether this is... Like I said, this could be... This could represent anything. This could represent an individual, male or female, or, or one or the other. It could represent the priest or not, or just, just like I said, the initiate. It does not matter. Um, but 
I don't like the separatism, whether it's like a Jehovah Witness type thing. They don't want to connect to and admit to other nations, either 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 root seeds within these other religions and, and nations because God contests them. This is the thing. You can have a religion within any of these nations. Their religion and their temple thing could be completely accurate and one with God, okay? But their king or their characters could be doing screwed up stuff. So it's not the religion necessarily. Even though you have, let's say, biblical things um, negating and prophesying in, the, in a negative way of and, 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 and criticizing how so-and-so is worshiping over here or other Israelites are doing this and that and blah, blah, blah. But the bottom line is, is that um, Israelites did these things. They did worship a three-bar cross or a cross or utilize a cross with Asherah. They did worship Ashur. Ashur is the God, no different, like just like Jesus is the God. The Father is unknowable. That's that's a constant thing. The Father is the is the depths of, of everything. The Son, the Logos, the consciousness is what you can understand. The Good Shepherd, which is a part of yourself. That's the part. So you so the, these systems, like I said before in my other videos, are nothing new. They've been around, they will be around, but this is what they mean. So you're looking at you're looking at the earliest forms of Jesus worship. What you're really looking at here is Christianity pre pre uh, the character that became Jesus Christus. Okay. And this is how Judaism actually worshiped this is how this is how the hebrews and moses moses was about this when with the story of nehushtan lifting up the serpent in the desert okay if you could look up that symbology and it's all basically a snake on a tau cross so the cross or a tau cross in general is a symbol of Judaism and part of its original thing, okay? And its association with Jesus is is highlighted and, you, and, and people can look that up on their own. The, co the connection between Jesus being raised on the cross and, ne and Moses raising up Nehushtan, the cross with the serpent, these are symbologies that are interconnected because the real religion is not what modern Judaism, rabbinical Judaism shows, nor what when the Hasmoneans came in uh, during the Maccabean revolt and brought in their Pharisee priests and they just rehashed the entire religion or they brought, there is, and, and um, was it Jonathan Adler, I believe, um, basically said there is clearly no evidence of any form of Judaic forms of worship with the holidays and the, and the modern things that Judaism, rabbinical Judaism has prior to the Hasmoneans. It was like second century BC. So there's no evidence. There's no nothing, nothing that 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 is about that because that got invented during that time period. I'm there's a there's a lot of biblical books that um, you basically. How else can I put it? It, it, it? It's quite simple. You basically have people that that are part of the, the, the Pharisaic groups that just denied the real religion of what they came from. And they rehashed that and reinterpreted that. They they took the stories of the of Canaanites and Babylonian things and and, and, and and or the region. Like I said, a lot of these stuff was just part of the culture. A lot of them was a lot of these stories and histories and creation epics and all that stuff was known. But they just rehashed it and put it down to one type of deity. But there's so many details in there that are not what they promote. And through medieval times, and especially within Christianity, all that stuff got simplified and, and hidden, hidden, whether deliberately or ignorantly. 
no different than something like this. You can't have a story of Moses raising up Nehushtan with a towel cross and, and uh, a snake put in, and, and, and utilizing that as a positive image and then just ignoring crosses and all these other things. It just doesn't work like that. And then, you, and then the clear passages and whatnot and the archaeological evidence that shows where these uh, altars and, and, and things are that, that Asherah or Asherah or Asher with the Asherah poles were there. Well, I mean, it's just, it's just ludicrous to think that these are separate religions. They're not separate religions. It's the original religion. So that's why I keep saying is that these formats within Christianity that a lot of people say is pagan. Pagan in the sense that ignorant people don't understand it. Pagan or not, they're just take, throw away the word pagan. Okay? Judeo-Christianity, Judeo Christianity in general, okay, is this religion. It's connected to it. The holidays are connected to it. I mean, there's obviously a lot of people are quite aware of the pagan holidays within Christianity. The overlap of um, the Passover symbology with the blood of the lamb and the door. And then also at the same time, you have at the same time of the year, you have Easter, Ishtar, with, with Jesus being crucified and death and resurrection and the blood of the lamb and forgiveness of sins and, the, and the, all this stuff. You have the cult of the firstborn, which is a well-known thing in uh, Judaism, which is basically... I think a corruption of um, Christian concepts because Jesus is a bread and wine sacrifice, which just goes down to the Melchizedek rituals and sacrifice the meal of Melchizedek with bread and wine, I think got reinterpreted and they developed various ideas, these, these primitives, viewed things in different incorrect ways and that's one of the and i'm going to elaborate that in another video that's one of the ways that the pharisee sect through the hasmonians and their idea these, these people were ignorant they basically had a, a i think it was more of a power trip political control thing and the religious component was their way of influence and to come in and do their things because and they were involved with uh, primitive practices from the outskirts of babylon and within babylon itself paganistic they really were pagan because it's not part of the official thing the official thing the official religion of every true temple was what i've mentioned before emanationist kabbalah type ideas all these other things were basically uh, bumpkin concepts or misunderstood pagan concepts applied, even though they were connected and rooted. Okay. And this is part, in my opinion, part of what the corruption, part of the, 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 the Israelite negation and corruption and cursing from God was because they corrupted the practices. They corrupted the Melchizedek practices. The Melchizedek tradition with bread and wine, the Christian tradition was how it was done. That's how Moses, I mean, uh, Abraham got blessed. He had to give up animal and human sacrifice and take on the ways of Melchizedek. It's that simple. So you're, it's the, the, the contrast between this, these two forms of ideas and ways of worship are at the crux of the matter. It's the heart of the matter. It is the prime component. You have this ancient form of worship that dealt with bread and wine and crosses and, and emanationism and going from a, 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 an apotheosis of, of going back to the source and uniting with the source. That's that that's simple. Then you had various formats where the Hasmoneans, when they came in and brought in the Pharisees, they took control and then 
established their barbecue cult. They're, they're, and that came from, you know, you have people that just like to kill things and, and, and barbecue. Barbecue your sins away, you know. And they ate them. They ate the food. They ate the sacrifices and all this stuff. And that was their way of, they were, they were, they were exploiting. They were exploiting the populace. And people really believed it. And they did that. But that's not how it was originally done. It didn't need to be done. Like I said in my other video, there's always been like two forms of religion, regardless what the deities are, that, that, that are either human and animal sacrifices or not. And that's it. There's, these are the two ways. And they've been at war with each other. And one way basically hijacked uh, rabbinical Judaism, Phariseeism, and Sadduceeism hijacked Christianity and and distorted many things um, within it. It's just that simple. Let me show. Here's what is known as the E of Delphi. This is part of, there's I'm just going to briefly elaborate because look at here how the pronunciation for the E at Delphi, it's a mystical thing. It's A or A, 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 E, okay? A, E, which means in Greek, thou art, okay? So let's look at this. E, I, A, E, E, that's exactly close to... Moses' statement, e -ye asher e -ye. Now, if you also look at this E, I, it would be easy as a line, because it's a letter E with a, a line, the, the, the capital I, to be L, E, L. Could easily go that way. And some people may have translated that way. Either, either one. But I'm just saying this is E, 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 E. This is at Delphi. So in other words, just say pronunciation of these vowels, these vowel chants. Vowel chants are part of the name of God. And they are used in a variety of ways. In Kabbalah, um, the, the Tetragrammaton is said in many different ways um, and used in a variety of fashions. So it's not, it's not uh, stigmatized and rigid because the vowel chant, the Tetragrammaton, is not necessarily the name of the deity. It's a way of hailing the deity. No different than when you're at a concert, you're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what you're doing. It's a way of hailing. It's like uh, one of the interpretations I saw was hail the eternities or hail the etern eternal ones. That's what Yah, I-A-A-W meant in Egypt. And that's how it was used. And this, but but the, these vowel forms are used in a variety of ways. The deity. So when you see these things where it's Yahweh and Asherah, meaning Yahweh's the God and Asherah's the feminine, no. It's Asher or Asherah and Ishtar, the cross, Ishtar, or the feminine. Let's just say the God, a feminine deity. Okay, let's leave it at that for people that, that want that or need that. That's fine. But the, the Yahweh part of it, is is part of the religious sanctimonious component of it and that was utilized in a variety of ways at many many temples no different than yah was used in the inanna story of going into the underworld and being raised by yah enki anki anchi anki the ankh think about that enki and ankh Okay, so, and the chi, ki, ro, the ki is a cross, it's an X. So you have crosses in a variety of formats all over these, the, the Mideast, Eurasia, the Levant, um, and they imply many of the same things. So, I hope you understand now 
my viewpoint of this. The Bible is, many aspects of it are not correctly um, interpreted properly. You have this word, I'll share, in a variety of ways, just downplayed and hidden. Look, <laughs> is my covenant which you shall keep. Right there should be a share. So that can be my covenant with a share you shall keep. I mean, it could just directly imply that. It could say that. So you have to be careful because it may not, depending on how it's used, obviously you have sounds, and you, but I just find it astonishing that your average scholar Anybody who studies these other nations knows their high deities. And Asher, Ashur, plays a gigantic role, whether it's from Egypt to Assyria to Samaria. And then you have Israel and the Hebrews, and somehow they're completely alienated from that, but yet they're using um, Canaanite divine names. They're using creation epics based on the Enuma Elish in their own format. And there's many, many, many other um, ties to different myths and stories from the region that are in the Bible itself and utilized one way or another. That's It's just anybody who seriously studies these things cannot deny this stuff because it's true. So this is something to think about. And I tried not to today to, once again, I try not to, I don't want to, I can open up a thousand pages and images and things and and, and I'm, I'm trying to just keep it simple i want to keep things simple and i will penetrate deeply deeper with more videos on certain concepts or if somebody requests something um but the whole point of this video and my take on things is to get people to to look at uh, the Bible itself in a different way, and also to realize that the forms of Christianity are what they are. They are modern versions of the most ancient religion with the most ancient symbology. They're, they are nothing new. They didn't borrow anything from anybody. They always had it. It was always there, whether it was through Christianity itself or whether it's through Judaism, historical correct Judaism, utilizing a Shedah or a Sher and the... Uh, the crosses and all that, the Asherah poles or whatever you want to call them, the stoutos, okay? Now, it doesn't matter whether these are spiritually, um, they mean anything. The point of the matter is that they're there for, as a historical thing. They're talked about historically. This deity name is in here all over the Bible that's being uh, basically ignored, okay? It's basically being ignored. You have, I just showed an academic in their dissertation, literally using the name Asher the way I use it. And it's all over the place. So this opens up a whole new world of interpretation, This of, of especially Hebraic studies in general. It changes everything. It really does. And unfortunately, I don't care what anybody thinks. Modern, modern Judaism has a problem in that it evolved into a fake religion and that's real um, that is what it is when you let's just say this you have many scholars that, that have become atheists because just the parallels that are within the bible itself and let's say other divine names from other nations or the jesus myths and stories and, and narratives uh seem parallel with something else so people have a hard time believing this and that okay the truth of the matter is is that judaism Judeo-Christianity, modern Judeo-Christianity, from this perspective, is, is the ancient religion. you got to put away the separatism. Just because, let's say, God condemned so-and-so or such-and-such -such nation or neighbor or whatever in the Bible, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean that they, at some point, didn't have something religious that was what was going on in their temples and their priests or internally with individuals. It has nothing to do with the narratives of the story. Because, like I said before, there was really only one religion. Whether people do something with it or not, or how they apply it, it it's, doesn't matter. So these, these neighboring nations had, they are a part of the religion. Let's say this, if people are from Adam and Eve, or from the children of Noah, 
yeah, so the, the Hebrews and the Israelites and the Jews are the chosen. No. I mean, yeah, they are set an example. The word Israel, according to Anatolitomenko, means a theomachist. So it's not in a positive light. And if the angel, according to Rashi, named Jacob Israel, Samael is technically the devil, the head of the Satan. So what does that mean? It means that Satan named Jacob Israel. I mean, where do you think that Jesus, when he accused the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and said they are of their father, the devil, and all this other stuff, and he's a liar from the beginning, blah, blah, blah. What do you think this stuff means? The modern viewpoint, whether people like it or not, I don't care if it's politically correct or not, it, it, the implications are what they are. So people could either deal with reality and actuality or they can, or they can be delusional and live in a fantasy world, which we get, we all do in a certain way. But these things imply something and mean something, and it's not what it. A lot of the stuff is not the way we've been told or raised, or through the media, or through the movies, or through whatever. A lot of it is just not like that, and and the implications are completely different. Anyways, I hope you got something from this video. And thanks for watching.